How you guys folks doing today? All right. Great to hear you. Nice to see everybody here. Nice to be proud of myself. Uh, usually I'm talking to people who are more into marine sciences, but a lot of overlap here. The previous invitation, I saw a lot of equipment I use as well. Uh, to my bulk is some drilling tanks. Uh, the message I give them drilling tanks is spend the money on a really good job. Don't go cheap on a real mess car with real glass tanks. Uh, you can crack them very, very easily. All right, it's guarded here. Yeah, I'm a biologist. I've been in Sarasota, Florida at the Boca Laboratory. Uh, I've been there for nine years now. Uh, oh, it's turn it up a little bit. Turn it up. There we go. Is that better? Okay, yeah. there we go. Good deal. So, yeah, I've been there for nine years. Uh, when I first got there, I knew what some pots were. Some pots being cuttlefish, octopus, nautilus. Um, but I really didn't understand their biology until I started looking at them on a daily basis. Um, so, this is a good, a good picture right here. It is a 15 day old uh, octopus. Uh, common octopus, uh, octopus vulgaris. Uh, it's, in, it's called parallel because it's actually not octopus as yet. And actually, at this point in time, this life cycle, they're platonic and they're just floating on the ocean in the open ocean. Uh, so we'll get to this guy in a little bit. So this is what I started with with these guys. Uh, taurus. These are the Atlantic pygmy octopus. Um, when I say pygmy, full grown, around a quarter of the summer dollar, so very, very small. Uh, this, this guy right there, I'll bit probably, this one individual there is the size of a penny right now, so very, very small. So this is how it all kind of started. Um, we do a lot of our own collections in Sarasota, Florida. There's a nice, the nice go from Mexico right there with all the permits to collect. Um, so right now, I was asking for a common from my collection department, but unfortunately, they got me the wrong species, which kind of happens so hard to identify. Uh, so he brought me in a pygmy, a really small animal in a little jar. Uh, when I got him into the lab, uh, I started working with him, and one day he came in and then laid eggs, and it was quite surprising to see the eggs were actually large. Um, big diversification, not that modified, is a large egg species and small egg species. Um, the large egg species are a lot easier to work with because when they come out, they're fully developed with no larval stage. The small egg guys have that larval stage, I haven't quite figured out just yet. Um, so I came in and saw the implant laid large eggs, and very exciting. It's the first time I got having that species with me. Um, usually I get the, the Atlantic dwarf, which is after Mr. Beanie, and this one would be the large egg species being a little taurus. So when it hatched out, that's, that's day one. This, this image I made in about five minutes and I was doing a presentation up in Tampa for a Florida Teen Science Cafe and I wanted to show the guy was there that day and so I took my camera out and got a pencil eraser and the eraser's on the outside of a jar and this animal has got for one moment just sat on a jar perfectly still and got the pencil eraser shot in there. Um, from there I gave it to my development department and they put it on our Facebook site and it blew up. Um, it was pretty incredible to see how much feedback I got from it. It's right getting uh, requests from France and Europe for information of the animals and getting a lot of funding for the, the project I was working on. Uh, worked out really well. I didn't really realize the power of the internet and making cheap little animals and how, how powerful that would be. So it's kind of hard to see this image here, but here's mom, and these are her the eggs. And you see the little embryonic octopus in here with her. Uh, she did, this, is a, this is a one inch PVC pipe to give it for scale. So again, these are very, very small animals. And you can really keep a lot of them in a small, small aquarium. Um, you can see the development, you can, some of the images I'll have, I'll show you. You'll see the yolk sac, you see the eyeball development, and she did actually do a really good job on her eggs. She was not very happy to open this up. Basically, all I had was a one inch PVC Street 90, or a cat that got back to it, a nice little hiding hole. And when the cat that got glued, I could open it up and make sure it's seen. If you give them a normal shell, uh, any kind of conch shell or anything else like that, they get in there and you can't see them or get them up breaking the shell. By using PVC, you can open it up and see what's going on. And you can see, I was, I was actually here for Christmas, and this happened on Christmas Day. Uh, so my co-workers actually sent me this image on our, our cell phone, and we got very, very excited about that. So I got back, and there's still all the developmental stages. So you can see it really developing here. You can see even at this point, you can see little color spots, little chromatic boards, double line, eye spots. Some still have a very large yolk sac. So I can kind of determine when they're actually born. When the yolk sac is pretty much gone, I knew that the next day they'd probably hatch out, and they did. So um, in the lab I worked in there, I mean, again, we're an independent nonprofit, not only the money, so I my philosophy is keep it simple. Um, so I use some standard glass tanks and sponge filters. Um, we are very lucky to be on the of Mexico, so I do use real seawater. Uh, because I'm not using Indian Ocean or Red Sea or like that. We use real seawater, we have ozone to sterilize it, and we use it in all tanks. Um, so we have basically all the resources for saltwater usage, which is incredible for us to use. Um, but yeah, very simple, uh, either glass bottle or very fine sand. Uh, the biggest thing about Octopi, you don't know about it, is they are escape artists. There was a local, uh, it was an example in New Zealand, like last month, the uh, Octopus named Inky uh, pulled a fighting Nemo, escaped his tank, and got back to the ocean. 
Uh, it's pretty incredible these guys can escape. Uh, so what, what a huge goal is, there's no escape, right? Fishing line, usually 20 pound test, and made it very, very tight. And then from there, I use high tech rocks to keep some weight on there. Uh, they need plenty of airflow. Uh, these animals in the cat environment are very, very messy. Uh, they eat a lot of food, they eat a lot of waste, and they actually shed suction discs daily. So they'll shed every disc in their body every day. Because of a lot of skin, there's a lot of detritus, a lot of ammonia buildup, so they do a lot of work changes. So my tank is very, very simple. It's a 10 gallon, 20 gallon, uh, some PVC hiding walls, and some other filters. So again, I use a lot of the same products you guys do, even at the deep part right here. Uh, it's such a very cheap, easy to replace, easy to maintain. Now, to explain these guys was the difficult part. Uh, Occupy in general are very cryptic and nocturnal. So, how do you get them to come out in the daytime when people walk around? Um, so, what I came up with this piece of idea, and this is right here, is probably about a small jar or so big glass with a cover on it. And what I did, I painted half the black and cut a little hole in the lid and made the, the non painted part black facing the viewing window for public to what I didn't realize is how smart these guys are. They realize that the other side is painted black, so every night they turn around, and I come in the next morning and they're all black faces. So every morning I turn around again to so see. So there were some challenges of doing these guys, but in this video for you, so you know how it works. So you got one right there, and then you got one behind it. I lucky enough found out that he's living in new flip groups. Most octopi are very cannibalistic and they're in huge territory. I had eight of them in a 20 gallon tank and they were totally fine together. Uh, that's the main reason why I was able to replicate this man. I actually took one female and made three generations from one female. Unfortunately, with inverts like this, the only way to keep them going all the time with culturing is in busy breeding, unfortunately, because you don't have the real ability to get root stock all the time, so I did end up inbreeding a lot. Um, what was interesting is they didn't breed in the cat and display stock, they only bred in the lab. And what it came down to is it's privacy. They wanted privacy. And this is really what we saw all day. They would move around from jar to jar. Um, sometimes they interact with them. One of my guys actually got a train to eat frozen food, which made my life a lot easier than going collecting all the time for black crabs and shrimp. Um, so once they got my frozen food job, it became a lot easier. Uh, there was no, no cannibalization. Um, but the display lasted about a year, year and a half. Um, it didn't really draw the wow factor that I like it to, so I lost it to like this great trick. It's awesome. You guys can talk of it, there's some no rivalry out of it, but really, at the end of the day, it wasn't really going to make anybody come through the front door anymore. So I, at this point in time, I've stopped this, this program. But in the same year, I was able to do a different species too. There's still a little bit here, but this picture right here is Octopus Boreris, uh, Caribbean Reef Octopus. And if anybody's familiar with uh, Pisces Energetic Mice and Shrimp, Freshwater shrimp, that's it right there. So, again, it's a one centimeter shrimp eating off feeding a little one centimeter octopus, and day one, I had to eat frozen food. Uh, but it was hard to head a bunch of these guys and trying to squeeze or feed all these guys. It was very, very difficult. So, to make it easier for myself, I actually had to go collect them a lot. Uh, my aquarium, lucky enough, is a little island in Mexico. It's around my grass beds all over the place. Made the bathing suit, bucket, and get the grass beds and get shrimp and crabs. So, I gave them the real food. Uh, so, that real food, the real water, makes my job much, much easier. I'm not really faking anything other than this box of water. So the marks, uh, they weren't that hard to take care of actually. So again, 20 gallon tank, uh, I ended up keeping seven on display and seven in the aquarium. I hate that and there would have all my eggs in one basket in one aquarium in case something crashes in the room, they had back up. Um, like I said before, they didn't lay eggs from the all on display. I think the fact that they're being stared at all made them feel comfortable and they wouldn't make morals for yourself, they wouldn't make dents for yourself, and they wouldn't actually do all the breeding had behind the scenes in the lab. But I've been in it three times, and they bred every, every nine months. Um, fortunately, these animals, even though they're intelligent and they're outgoing, very, very short lifespan. Generally, 12 months to 18 months tops. Uh, nothing you can do about it, so it's hard to get, and you don't get too attached to them because they go away pretty, pretty rapidly. Like I said, when you're on display, they're generally always showing the uh, defensive posture. Basically, they're always the tentacles out and their beak showing, and they're just constantly not going to get in the fight and defend themselves, and they always have eyeballs on. Uh, these animals are very intelligent, they, they know what eyes are, especially camera lines. Um, but camera lines are definitely a giant eyeball, so when they get interested in all day, and they get all day, they didn't feel very good, and they wouldn't be comfortable with the breeds, and they all the breeding happen behind the scenes. But here's the other species that I didn't want to breed. I got lucky enough to attack at the exact same time. Both these animals were at the same time. I had eggs everywhere. Uh, almost too many eggs, so I actually had a surplus. Uh, but here's the octopus, uh, three errors, the three being the octopus. You find these guys mostly the keys. Uh, here are their eggs, same thing, large egg species. 
So you got Ms. Law, Ms. Law over there and the Yolk Sack and Mom's back behind here. Um, interesting about these guys, these, these guys are really cannibalistic and it was difficult even getting the babies away from Mom. Um, I went and I looked every day and watched the Yolk Sack and shrink and shrink and shrink and maybe get bigger and bigger. And I knew we were going to hatch one day, so I started putting in a little hiding hole some babies, a little quarter inch piece of kitty shit that when they hatch out, they're going to hide there. I came in a few mornings, a lot of eggs were hatched and there were no big apples to be found. What I found out was Mom was eating them as they were hatching. So not very smart to go to work yourself to eat your young. I'm thinking a while they might lay eggs and abandon them and the eggs hatch on their own. Uh, that she was basically raised her basically 35 gallon trash can in the taxidermy system. Uh, she had nowhere to go when they hatched out. She just got those eaters and they got it. They touched her and she grabbed them and ate them. So what I actually do it after a while, more uh, features of most dads, they actually steal the eggs away from mom. She's not like that very much at all. Look very inky and white. Uh, the legs are laid on these very long stringers right here, and there's some straw. It's almost like 20 pound test fish lines. So when I pull up the wall, they actually really had to pull a snap out of the line off. Some of them actually had cut off. Um, so these eggs were laid in usually high flow areas, but you handle a lot of turbulence and deal with that. So when we hatched out, that's day one of the uh, octopus varus, and the octopus. So again, very, very small, uh, more translucent, less pigmentation, less chromatophores. Um, but again, cannibalistic. So I had to catch babies out and put them in their own containers. I put them in one container and give them one dominate the inner body. I'll try to make them more in this one. Um, so what I had to do was basically put more containers, uh, cut the lead out a little bit, and then uh, glue in its window screen, and then put those individual boxes in a large sump on the same system. Um, I ended up having 17 animals, uh, and I raised about seven to about the A size. And at that point, I had seven animals to get over two pounds. I had no room for seven of them, so I ended up surplusing five. So we're going to throw the egg water mail in their aquariums. It went to Minnesota, uh, New Mexico, and I kept two for ourselves, hoping they could produce that. But only two of your odds of that female parent. Not that it's odds, but it's only going to move towards two of them. I'll show you that in a little bit. Is that a pencil eraser? Yeah, it's a pencil eraser for scale. Yeah. So again, she, the, the, the female layer eggs of a fake uh, plastic rock uh, along the wall, and she's back in there right now. Um, the tank, the tank itself is about 90 gallons, attached to a thousand gallon system. Full life support, including pretty scavenging fluorides, bags, degas, chambers, a whole extra bag. And again, I use grill support, which is a huge light gun. Uh, people try and do this in a couple of over and all that. They can do it, but not to the high extent because they can't use this water when they have high high nitrites and phosphate problems and all that stuff. I have a water quality issue. I just flush the tank out completely because I have the ability to do so. So, like I said, I had way too many eggs, so I ended up uh, I work with a lot of the birds in the industry, one of them is Monterey Bay Club in California, I have a good friend out there. So I ended up putting some eggs in a bag and mailing it to them. Um, and they arrived just fine, and they actually hatched them out and raised them up. Uh, when I went to visit there uh, last March, I actually got to see one of my, my eggs in full form on display, and I was like, it's kind of cool to be able to share your, your offspring with others using aquariums in the country and see them become display animals and help educate a little bit in the aquarium world, so it was nice. So again, I kept two, just to keep this going, but the odds of being now being up there were not very high. So I grew up, this is uh, probably about six weeks in, a uh, 20 gallon tank, uh, two brush scale. I just put other things to my phone and other things to it, and this is kind of universal. Uh, you, you can see in the picture, the beaks right there. Um, with these animals, the only part of the body that can not compress is their eyeball beak. So anything the size of that beak, they can escape through. Um, so again, very, very tight eating lids and a lot of weights on top so they couldn't get out. They don't have fins, so on, on any kind of surface, they're very mobile. Uh, don't put up here, you knock them off, but I never had any escapes. <laughs> Here's a cool video. So, again, I raised two to adulthood, and no intercannibalistic kind of I had someone introduce them to see if they would meet. And so I had a, a, a 120 gallon tank, I had to use an egg crate divider to put together, and I came in one morning and the lights had just turned on, and these are nocturnal animals. It was still dark in the room. Um, you can kind of see my, my reflection right there, getting the video going, and I actually captured the octopus meeting. So what you're seeing here is a handoff. Uh, the male has a specialized arm with a little groove channel in here and actually deposits what we call sperm packets, which is metaphor, inside the mantle of the other animal. And at that point, she either, either decides to accept it and kind of break it open and use it, store it for a while until she has the energy to make eggs, or throw it away and get a new male. Jokes on me, they end up being boys. So, 
This didn't go very far. They made it a few times, but obviously no eggs. Uh, this animal on the right lasted about three more weeks before it passed away. This one lasted about four more months to it passed away. So the coolest thing for me with this project, even though I didn't get another generation out of it, I got to see the entire lifespan now, from day one of hatching to the end of their life. Before that, I was getting animals collected in the wild. They're already some adults. I had no idea what they were born, how old they were, what sex they were, I knew nothing about that. So that worked from day one from the egg. I actually got a few more in my hand, which is pretty cool. Um, I get to understand the full life cycle, so I get to animal for a while, and I can better gauge and judge where it's going. But we'll get questions in the end. So here's the animal lottery right made for when they're in their tanks. Now their animals are a lot bigger than mine, uh, a little fatter, because uh, it, it, it keeps their tanks a little cooler. Uh, and temperature is a big thing with these guys, being, uh, being cold water, it reverberates. Uh, cold water tends to absorb them a little bit, they get a little bulkier in cold water. Uh, we're at, it's 90 degrees for the right now. We have two seasons hot and hotter. Uh, so keeping things, keep things cool in Florida would be difficult. So the other one I'm working with um, is octopus vulgar, so the common octopus. The main reason I wanted to bring this animal forward is the best display animal in the bunch. The Mercatoris being tiny and, and, and nocturnal, the vulgar studying the uh, rigid rares, even more nocturnal and cryptic and tiny. Horrible display animals. So I wanted to make an animal that I could actually use to display, and that's the vulgar. <coughs> That's common. I mean, it's all right Atlantic, Caribbean, uh, Mediterranean, uh, all over the place. Uh, so they're easy to get a hold of. But they have a challenging life cycle where they have paralarm, which means they basically, when they're born, the, the plankton is about two millimeters in length. Uh, they stay in the for 45 days. In that 45 days, they morph and change food needs nine times. So trying to fake this environment and create this food chain is my biggest challenge. Uh, as far as I got, I've got to be 28 so far. So I'm getting there. The biggest challenge for me is the number of trials. To get this to get back to square one again, it's got to be a, a female in the wild, three females. She already got to be pregnant and a sperm bag. She doesn't want to lay eggs, so then they're going to eggs hatch. Um, so the time I'm in there, but I've only had I've only had four trials, four tries at this whole year's project. So it's not something new on a daily basis. It's one time I'm doing. Uh, so when I do it, I put a lot of work into it. Now it has been done before. Um, by this place group here, this is a group in, in Spain. But they had scientists, five scientists, for eight hours a day doing this project, so they put a lot of energy into it. And the reason they were doing this is also animals we eat a lot. They're trying to farm the animal, they're trying to make a profitable farm animal. Um, so far, it's not a problem at all. Octopus farms pop and go down and once. This guy's dead and figured it out just yet. So, as my goal is I can figure out how to farm them, then I got a really good idea. So, Bulgaris, uh, because they're plectonic, they eat other plankton. Is challenging to do so. Uh, basically, the lot of the main food source in the aquarium is our TV and aqua, basically, brine shrimp eggs hatch down. That's a piece of our food chain for our jellyfish and our seahorses and all that stuff. So, that's the easy to get a hold of and have all the time. It doesn't work against guys at all. They don't like it. It's not enough uh, carbohydrates, but it's in there for uh, what they want is crabs and all crab crustacean water. That you really can't go by a lot. Um, so, I try to figure out how to get a hold of that. And my first idea is I go collect it. Get plankton nets and plankton toes out in the Gulf and figure it out. That worked. But sorting plankton to get what you need is hours and hours of work. Thankfully, I had interns and volunteers help me do it, but it really didn't. It wasn't with the effort. Trying to get five crabs so an hour of time didn't work at all. So, what I ended up doing was actually collecting egg bound shrimp and egg bound crabs, put them in a 10 gallon tank, and they spawned around. Then I had a good number of what I needed food sources, but it's all timing. By the time I figured it out, the more the air is longer working. So again, trials. So the more trial I get, the more assessment I have. Um, yeah, so like I said before, I got to be 28 at one point, which is pretty neat. They actually grew a little bit. Their little ink glands worked, their metaphors worked. Um, they ended up being a little bit cannibalistic, but not bad. Um, but again, the best thing to find for was shrimp and crabs. So, uh, by going out in the Gulf and getting pink or white shrimp or even grass shrimp and eggs on them, hatching them out, the same with uh, little mud crabs. Uh, stone crab volume was too big, uh, the mud crab zone was a perfect size. So I had to also figure out what my con size could be the best part. And again, they have only made 28, so I'm only halfway there. So it's still a very large challenge. I had to make figures out. And that's, that's about halfway through the life cycle, so this is day 15. Um, so you can, you can see the metaphors, they got it all skewed, uh, right here to beat in the ink plan. Um, so they're, they're not even fully functional. They, they, they had the eight arms, they only have three arms. Um, so they, they do more over time. And as I could, uh, at one point in time ago, we had a blue octopus at this point, and blue rings are a trip to work with, being infected and kill you. Um, so, uh, working with this good is very challenging. Uh, blue octopus, you want to do a lot of enrichment, which means you play with them. 
I couldn't play with this guy. I couldn't get my hands and any of that stuff, so I had to be very careful. And we could do with him really much wise was uh, flow pattern changes, enhancements that way, you know, buy food items, that kind of stuff. Uh, what I came to find is everybody thought the blue ring was all the way through those blue colors when they were defensive or scared. On uh, this video, I show you how to spin the animal, and he's very happy. And throw in blue colors. It's kind of hard to see the fly photos, but the rings on the animal looked bright fluorescent blue. It was very, very cool looking. Uh, animal small, silver dollar size, very, very small animal. Um, actually, come one, I came in one morning, actually had an ancient species for it. And what's neat about these guys, they don't lay their eggs inside shells, they actually carry them around. You know, the females are marked like a spider, and she had bundle eggs inside her, inside her mantle. Um, we had a work with the uh, FWC, with the fish, Florida Fish and Wildlife, to get her different species, because it was venomous and no alien. This guy, uh, when we heard we had eggs, he told us to destroy them immediately because last thing we needed to have this guy. We lived in Florida, in Florida waters. That all kind of impact each second they could get up. This guy went around. Uh, so, yeah, that's our presentation. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I know it's a different topic for you guys, but uh, we still did something different and fun. So, any questions, fire away. That first one you were speaking of, the one that was a different uh, species, mm -hmm. um, when they said you had it long enough, did it go like that? Yeah, the, uh, I ended up surplusing the, uh, the Caribbean the post careers, two fibers of aquariums, and I sent two to Albuquerque, one to Minnesota, one to Florida Aquarium, I believe. So I pulled them out. Uh, the Mercatoris I kept in house because they were small and they looked in numbers. I kept, I kept them all. It was nice. Uh, I actually had requests in the last few weeks to get going again because now, after I did this presentation a few times, other aquariums are going to display as well. And the Mercatoris are going to come by, so they asked me, I'm still reading it, I'm not right now, so I might start to get that because it's, it's down in Maine for it. Any more questions? I was yes. curious how long they store the serum packs in the envelope. Um, months. They can store them months, yeah, absolutely. Months, yeah. Months, yeah. Yeah. Right. Did you try any other packages that existed for the young? No, uh, I basically relied on most of you. Well, I guess you can go out and collect them. It's basically, yeah, I think why you try to fake it when you think you get the real thing. Right. Um, what I would do, I did a lot of people, you know, which I was doing a lot of mice and shrimp, I would make sure you don't live in the order of birth, or not lie. Do wild type of stuff, but it's a wild, it's already built up naturally. Uh, when we cross these kinds of invertebrates, I had no worry about the quarantine process. On the other part of the corner, any kind of invertebrate being fish, I couldn't do this. We have to abide by any of the other regulations, and we have to make sure all our fish are quarantined properly. Going collecting is basically the polar opposite of keeping these quarantined. So, being invertebrates, uh, having that little loophole, I can get away with that. You said something about the green cycle. Just once to pass away. Um, some will lay more than one clutch in a lifetime, but it's very, very rare. Um, all this is energy dependent, so the more you feed them, the more energy they have, and the more eggs they produce. So if they lay a batch of eggs at a younger age, they'll probably have time and energy to lay more. But generally, only maximum two clutches. Yes? Um, actually, bigger themselves. 
Uh, but a lot of these animals, uh, the sea octopi and, and their saliva, they have a novocaine and novocaine agent. Um, so when you bite it, any kind of hard body animal will bigger themselves and kind of just keep. And it's pretty powerful stuff. And I kind of learned this mentality is a stoic slot kind of mentality in mine. Um, so a few times I've gotten played by the person I got a little carried away and it bit me. And about two minutes later, my whole left arm was numb for about two hours. So some of these guys have been pretty hot. The smaller they are, the more toxic they are. Those are the rules I'm not to play. Plus they're cold-blooded and you're warm-blooded. Correct. So Correct. Yeah. 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 They're 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 Mm -hmm. Exactly, we're flowing with people like those guys, absolutely. All right, any more questions for me? Great, thanks guys, appreciate it.